So, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll get started. It's now 10.03 here in Stockholm. I would like to wish you all a warm welcome to this morning's BSCC webinar. And I'm delighted to see you all in this digital room and to supporting our mission of promoting bilateral trade by sharing your knowledge, promoting your companies and doing our very best to introducing and referring our members to each other and to potential business partners. Also, uh, a warm welcome to our guest of honor and speaker talking to us from London, Alex Dean, and also our moderator, Ian Richardson. We are continuously very keen to hear your feedback and suggestions, so please do get in touch if you would like to. And uh, we would like this meeting this morning to be interactive. So please uh, do write your questions uh, using the Q&A button during the presentation. And we will come back to you as soon as it is relevant to have the Q&A. So we aim with these webinars to give our members and corporation partners a solid foundation and also a platform to discuss some of the presumptions for the future development in the world. And challenges that we're all facing right now are, of course, the pandemic, the digital transformation, which is going very fast. And as we see it, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, revolution um, the outcome of the US election, and not the least, the EU exit that we're all looking into right now, and which is changing by the minute, it feels like, uh, the, the outcome. Um, so before um, moving on to, to this morning's theme, I would like to quickly run through the housekeeping rules. Um, so this presentation will be recorded and please keep yourself on mute until given the word if you would like to. Um, and please, as I said, do ask your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You are now well aware of where that is, I take it. And we will, uh, even though it's recorded, operate under Shutter House rules. If you have any technical issues, do email Emil Schellqvist. Um, so today, to moderate this topical theme, we're very pleased to have with us Ian Richardson, uh, who's Director of Executive Education at the University of Stockholm. Ian is lecturing on strategy, leadership, political, marketing and public affairs, um, which is one of the reasons, Ian, why I thought you would be excellent for this uh, session to moderate. And before uh, you um, started the academic, working in the academic world, um, Ian has also man uh, managed a number of businesses in the publishing and internet sector. Um, I would not like to take up any more time. So Ian, I'm so pleased to hand over to you to take us through this discussion on the UK political landscape and the EU exit, I hope. Um, the floor is yours, Ian. Okay, thanks, Christina, and welcome everyone uh, for joining us this morning. Um, we have, I think, an extremely interesting event uh, lined up. We've got uh, just over nine weeks to go before the transition period expires and negotiators on both sides are working around the clock and navigating uh, very highly charged political waters to reach an agreement on the terms, um, albeit rather narrow terms of a future UK EU relationship, in particular, of course, the terms of a future trade deal. And if you missed the latest comments on both sides yesterday, suffice to say that time is running out and there's still considerable uncertainty over whether a deal can and will be struck. Um, certainly the precise contours of any such deal in business and political terms are still far from clear at this time. The purpose of this session is twofold. Uh, first, to consider the UK political context within which these negotiations are taking place. And second, to get an insider view on the implications of a deal or no deal separation from a UK political perspective. And to that end, I, I'm very pleased to introduce Alex Dean, uh, Senior Managing Director 
and Head of Public Affairs at FTI Consulting in London. Alex is a qualified barrister uh, with more than 15 years experience in advocacy at FTI, Weber Shandwick and Bell Pottinger, where he's worked as a senior advisor to many high profile individuals and companies, organizations across many sectors. He's been an active member of the Conservative Party since 1995. He served as Chief of Staff to David Cameron and Tim Collins during their terms as Shadow Secretaries of State. And between 2011 to 2017, he was elected a common councilman in the city of London, where he served in, on the Policy and Resources Committee, which is the city's main forum for decision making. Alex is a prominent libertarian. He served as the founding director of civil liberties campaign group Big Brother Watch, and he frequently appears as a political commentator in the press and on British television. I should point out that he's also a former world debating champion, so unless anyone here is feeling especially bullish this morning, we'd better go easy on him for our own sakes. Alex, thanks so much for being here this morning and for agreeing to share your views with us. Well, thank you. It's a very generous um, introduction that I only broadly wrote myself. Um, I should start by saying that we are very interested in Brexit, but one should acknowledge that it has almost never been the central focus for European um, attentions or for global attentions. At present, as Christine was um, alluding to, the US elections loom large over everything. But moreover, um, the coronavirus, first time it's been said on this call, and we're 10 minutes in, it's a, a record, the coronavirus has changed the world and it has changed the nature of Brexit negotiations. I want to take a moment to explain what I mean. Apart from anything else, <coughs> when your negotiating teams are infected, it changes talks. When your teams can't sit down in person and discuss things directly for parts of their conversations, rather than being able to have side conversations over coffee, you dial in at a certain time, you have an agenda, and then you dial out again, it changes talks. I and mean, we're now back to physical meetings again, but there were times when the parties weren't able to do that. But moreover, Political attention has been and will be on the global pandemic and the way that it's affecting our individual countries. So one, we've lost some political focus. And two, I would say that we've lost economic focus in 2020 on Brexit because of coronavirus. It, whatever your position on Brexit, whatever your view, it is difficult to argue that a deal is very important economically or that no deal is very important economically when we have just run our economies into the ground to attempt to defeat the coronavirus. It is exceptionally difficult, I think, for any observer or analyst to argue that any effect from Brexit economically will be more significant than what countries have done themselves to try to get around coronavirus. So on the one hand, for people who, um, who say, look, no deal is fine, let's get on with it, they have argued that you know, this is the perfect time to plow ahead and get no deal done, because if, if, if there is uh, an impact uh, from tariffs, uh, then it will be a tiny, tiny one as compared to the impact of what we have um, seen happen because of coronavirus. And on the other hand, for those people who are urging us towards uh, getting a deal done, frustrated as they uh, must be in current circumstances, there is almost no point in um, arguing the finer details of some of the things that the parties have found themselves tripped up on, given the scope and scale of the challenges that economies are facing more broadly. So I suppose if you were in that camp, you're, you're more in, the, um, you're more in the, the line of thinking that says, let's look to seek to agree heads of terms, as we've seen discussed several times in these uh, processes, let's agree heads of terms and get on with things. Because who on earth knows what the global economy or the European economy is going to look like in a quarter or two's time. So it's, it's foolish not to be able to see the wood for the trees and to disappear into the uh, minutiae of a deal when we have no real idea of what uh, global economics will look like in 2022 and beyond. Um, all that is by way of, of saying, I suppose, that uh, as Ian and I were reflecting before we came onto the call, four years ago, when uh, more than four years ago, when my country voted to leave the European Union, and I started doing these kinds of briefings for businesses, large and small, mostly large, I used to do PowerPoints. Well, believe me, I've given up on that because the speed of change and the speed of conversation is such that this kind of narrative and this kind of exchange, and I hope we are going to move into conversation sooner rather than later, um, it is best. But I wanted to say a few things before uh, turning back to, you, uh, back to you about where I think the broad environment is and where the political uh, environment is in the UK particularly. Um, we are looking now to move to intensive night and day talks on everything, including legal texts. That's what Michel Barnier has told us, and that is music to the ears of those who thought that we might be moving to uh, no deal territory because the uh, 
UK delegation. It's impossible to walk out of something you're not sitting in, but theoretically, symbolically walked out of the negotiating um, processes. Um, I think that that was almost inevitable as a kind of gesture to say that we're willing to um, we're willing to move on if we don't make progress, because this government has been determined. This British government has been determined to indicate and to illustrate to its European friends and partners that it is serious when it says no deal is better than a bad deal, because the last administration under Theresa May said that and plainly didn't mean it and was never believed uh, on, uh, on that notion. Uh, and I think that permeates through some of the uh, posturing and positioning that's been taken by the British government, and I hope it helps you to understand some of the narrative around the British position. But I think it also helps to inform us on the timetable. It'll feel like ancient history to think about the summer uh, now, but of course the summer was the last time formally and theoretically that we might have seen an extension to the transition period that we are currently in for the UK's quasi-membership, associate membership of the European uh, Union. And the British government decided not to extend uh, our transition and had telegraphed for some time, whatever else you think about the British position, had been very clear that it didn't want to extend the transition period. Um, it's worth pausing and thinking about why that might be the case and why uh, it's instructive about what kind of arrangement we might seek to have going forward with uh, the European Union and the UK. Um, I think the UK didn't want to extend the transition period, first of all, because there's a strong belief in, uh, in the UK that um, a deal with European Union officials is always agreed at the last minute, it, or actually literally at the last minute, quite often pausing the clock, holding the, 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 the minute hand at one minute to midnight and pretend, maintaining the fiction that you're still in uh, the day to go. Well, if you keep extending things and you extend the transition period, then you never get to the last minute when those agreements are done. And it certainly does see, seem that we're moving towards compromise amongst the parties as the deadline actually uh, approaches. Second reason I think the UK didn't want to extend the uh, transition period was that the UK is increasingly seeking to formulate deals with third parties. Uh, as you'll have seen, there's been a great deal of rhetoric about that. And indeed, there is now some significant substance to it with a deal between the UK and Japan. Um, that's the kind of deal that the UK wants to seek to do more of. And there was a fear and concern that if uh, the UK was still potentially in a transition period with the EU in 2021, and who knows, perhaps beyond, uh, then third parties would not know, would not have certainty about the kind of partner they were entering into an agreement with. But thirdly and finally, and this is another way in which the virus has changed things, the UK wanted to avoid any potential liability for contributions to the EU's coronavirus bailout package that has been agreed between the EU nations. You will have noticed that many people regard that package as inadequate or, um, or too slow uh, in, in the way that it's going to be unfolded. Ro rolling over a six year period and much of it in, um, in economic terms that are less generous than some member states would prefer. And Macron, of course, um, wanted it to be higher than the 750 billion euros that it's wound up being agreed at. But nevertheless, it was felt to be perverse in the UK that um, the British government might be liable for contributions to that bailout fund a full four years after having voted to leave the European Union. So that's part of the mindset about how we've come to be here. And I think one of the things I, I would want to stress before uh, turning to your questions is about the nature of domestic British politics and what's happening within it. Firstly, and perhaps most importantly, I think that most people have underreported or not understood the extent to which our Prime Minister was very sick himself from coronavirus. The health of our Prime Minister was really in the balance uh, uh, this year, and there were some people who, who were very concerned at the heart of government about whether he would, he would make it, whether he would survive uh, his time with coronavirus. That has permeated the government and it has permeated the Brexit negotiations and his negotiating team. We can discuss how healthy it is to have a government so dependent for its buoyancy on one individual. The answer is probably not very, uh, but, but nevertheless, it's clear that that is the case, that this is a government very highly dependent on, on Boris Johnson and he has been hit hard by coronavirus um, himself. Secondly, uh, we've seen a move and a shift to Keir Starmer leading the Labour Party, our opposition party in the United Kingdom, um, as opposed to Jeremy Corbyn, who led the Labour Party to defeat in the December 2019 general election. Um, Starmer is a far more mainstream character than his predecessor, and he has not nailed his colours to a uh, remain uh, mast. He has, contrary to the, the views of some of his grassroots supporters, he has not argued that he would 
seek to stymie Brexit, and he has not argued that he would seek to have the UK rejoin the European Union promptly uh, were the Labour Party to win a general election. And, and I would look at it like this. Um, the Labour Party at the last election, 2019, had one something like 1.7 million habitual voters, 1.7 million habitual voters vote for the Conservative Party, loan their votes to the to the government in what was broadly speaking regarded as a Brexit election, as a confirmatory election on the Brexit process. Um, but in our 2016 uh, referendum on our membership of the European Union, some five million uh, Labour voters voted to leave the EU. So if you look at it from that perspective. Keir Starmer still got more than 3 million votes left to lose if he adopts a two euro positive position in uh, British politics. And what he wants more than anything, of course, is to be in power and to be in 10 Downing Street. So that is what is governing and determining uh, the position that's being taken by our leader of the opposition. Um, I've got lots, I think, to, to think about the, the future of, of that leadership, both in the Conservative Party and the Labour Party. I've got Lots, I think, to, to think about what the relationship between the UK and the rest of the world looks like. But I'm going to stop uh, talking there and open to your questions. Uh, Alex, thank you very much for that. I think it's really helpful for everyone to get a sense of, of, of where um, much of the political stance in the UK is coming from. As a Brit myself, I have a fairly good feel for how this plays out. I sometimes don't quite believe it, but I, I understand where it comes from. Um, I want to pick you up um, a point on, on the COVID-19 impact, if, if I may, the corona crisis in the, in the UK. Um, it's been suggested in some quarters um, that, that the economic impact of Brexit has been somehow politically buried in, in the COVID uh, crisis. Yeah. I, I mean, I've heard of Brexit, for instance, being a, a drop in the ocean, you know, uh, compared with the effects of COVID, which aside from being wrong actually in the long term in the macro sense sure um is is and this is the point actually that the uk is on track not for an either or but for both the, the compound impact of both brexit and the coronavirus the second wave of the coronavirus and the possibility of potential falls in sterling if it's a no deal this this could i mean this has all the make i don't know i don't want to be overly dramatic but doesn't this have the the, the hallmarks potentially of some kind of perfect storm in the first quarter of next year? Yeah, it's a fair question. And I, I mean, I should have made clear if I didn't. I still think we're online to have a deal between the parties. Most of the deal text is written and the areas of outstanding disputes are limited and manageable uh, and much more manageable than they often are at this stage between other um, kinds of, uh, of parties. So um, some of this, let's be clear, some of the reason we haven't got to a deal yet is political grandstanding. And I, I'm not on both sides, on all sides. Um, but I, I think a deal is more likely than not. But taking your fair question at face value, Ian, I would say that you are right. There has been a, um, a hardening, calluses grown over the uh, potential sensitivity to economic impacts. Um, and part of that is political uh, rhetoric. On the one hand, it, I mean, it is, we were told in the UK by our then Chancellor George Osborne that if we voted to leave the EU, the mere, the mere act of doing so would have a severe and profound economic impact on uh, the UK economy, that we would be plunged into a recession and have half a million more people unemployed. Mm. Now, of course, that wasn't actually true. And so uh, because there was kind of over-promising from those who were seeking to urge us to remain in the EU at the time, in a position of responsibility like that, uh, there are people who... Um, who are just inured to any kind of, of suggestion that your economy is going to do badly. Of course, from, from the perspective you are accurately describing, Ian, the problem with the boy who cried wolf is that eventually the wolf is there. And, and actually you can have a real threat. And just because someone was wrong about the threat that they identified before or exaggerated it, doesn't mean that the threat doesn't exist. But the second thing I think I would, I would point to is the fact that um, what we are demonstrating now is some quite Keynesian left-wing economic truths about the fact that governments can go into debt, unlike sovereign, unlike corporations or individuals, governments can go into remarkable levels of debt to be paid back over decades, very long term periods, in order to see uh, them through periods of crisis. We normally think of those periods of crisis solely as being wartime, basically. But actually, we're treating this crisis as basically being like a war. Uh, and the UK government is going to be paying off the debt that it's, cut, that it's accumulated to deal with the coronavirus so far into the 2080s and 2090s. 
people on this call have, have children, have grandchildren. If they were in the UK, their grandchildren would be entering the workforce and paying off our coronavirus debt until they retired. Now, we used to think, uh, conservatives used to think that um, that kind of debt is immoral, that handing debt onto the shoulders of children yet to be born is immoral. But that thinking has gone out the window in this period. And the reason I set all that out is there are some who argue, and there's obvious in face value attraction to this, that if we can do that for coronavirus, if there is any economic uh, impact from Brexit, well, you can just chuck it in the same bucket, can't you? Well, which is not quite how global economics work, but there is, on the other hand, some potential upsides from UK freedom to be able to, <coughs> excuse me, to deal with a freer hand with third parties, with things like uh, services, where the UK has always um, uh, excelled and the European Union has never concluded a deal with a third party that includes services and indeed hasn't um, completed the market, the internal market in services itself. So um, there are some potential genuine conversations to be had, but you are absolutely right. That argument that it doesn't really matter anymore what the economic impact of Brexit is, it, it is happening. The trouble, the other problem I'd identify with it is, it's a completely macro argument and it ignores all the realities of individuals who say, well, yeah, there might not be a profound economic impact country to country, but my company is going to go under. Well, that's a fair point, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I mean just l listening to that, I mean, a lot of pragmatists would say, um, at a time like this, when we're rushing and scrambling to just kind of put, the, put some wet ink on, on a deal, to get a deal done, to get us over the line, does it not make sense to, to maybe extend this transition period and, 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 you know, buy ourselves a little bit of time, let's just try and sort of get our way through this crisis and then, and then deal with the matter at hand? Sure. The, tr the trouble amongst some <coughs> people that the government, excuse me, sorry, a bit of a cough, trouble the government, some of the people the government relies on for its support in Parliament is that there was quite a um, feverish belief that any such thing would be an attempt to stymie Brexit per se, and it would just be followed by another one and another one and another one. I actually think that um, what you describe is absolutely possible. Um, whilst the legal formula would suggest that the, the transition period can't now be extended, actually, where there is a political will, the parties can find a legal way. Uh, and even at this late stage, or even in three weeks' time, if David Frost and Michelle Barnier both said, we're very nearly there, uh, we're almost uh, got to the, to the point of agreement, we just need a couple more weeks, I actually think it would be eminently possible that that would happen. But intuitively, given how much can be done in the last minute of negotiations, and I re let's remove this from the Brexit context completely. Most of the GATT trade deals are done in the very last minute. Most WTO trade deals are done in the very last minute. And most third party deals are done at the very uh, last minute. Indeed, the EU deals with other countries tend to be done at the last minute. There is a benefit to, to, to forcing things. There is a benefit to having a deadline. And what I would see as more realistic is the party saying in a scramble, on the last day or the penultimate day, we need another 48 hours. That kind of transition, I think is actually quite likely, uh, extension of the transition is quite likely because I think uh, the parties, I've been clear on, I hope, I think there's gonna be a deal. I think it, the, it, the, the matters uh, outstanding are relatively small. And secondly, I, I think that the parties want a deal. It's very clear actually that the parties play, are, are not despite some of the posturing that we've seen from both sides, I think that the parties actually want to have a deal and want to keep trade links and trade flows open. That has been, un that sentiment has been uninterrupted by uh, coronavirus. That has remained true. The focus may have diminished because of coronavirus, but the desire has not. We have a question actually from the floor um, from Frederick uh, Bjerkman. Uh, Frederick, I don't know if you want to unmute and ask this. Um, this is, uh, we'll see where this takes us. I'll give you a couple of seconds just to see if you're still with us, <laughs> if he's disappeared for a coffee. I'll ask it anyway. He asks, um, what constitutes a successful outcome for the UK of the current Brexit negotiations and what would be a disaster in a couple of kind of headline statements? So it depends almost completely on which audience you're aiming at. I, I've often described political debates and the way that you might um, summarize them as looking through the lens of different newscasters with different perspectives who can report the same thing as triumph and disaster from different perspectives. Um, from the uh, Brexiteer perspective, a disaster would be something that left over financial contributions to the EU. And I don't mean the one-off payment. The UK, and including Eurosceptics, the United Kingdom has basically <coughs> reconciled itself to, to a, a payment in the event of a deal. That payment, by the way, isn't going to be finalized until 2029. 
and the amount is still uncertain. But the UK has agreed to make a significant financial payment into the European Union in the event of a deal on our full exit of transition period, exit from the European Union. People have reconciled themselves to that and can accept that. What would not be accepted from the Eurosceptic perspective and the, Euro, the Eurosceptic titles, from the Daily Express, from the um, Daily Telegraph, from the Spectator perspective that I'm describing, what would not be acceptable is an open-ended um, commitment to contribute to the European Union going forward, to pay for our access in a way that, for, for argument's sake, and the often made comparison, Canada does not make an open-ended financial contribution to the um, EU. And I think a good uh, resolution would be the parties uh, and, and indeed a good resolution across the newspaper spectrum that I was describing. A good resolution uh, would be reaching a deal where the parties say, fantastic, we've done it. Trade is uninterrupted on day one. Uh, there's, no there's no problem anymore with Northern Ireland and uh, trucks aren't going to be backing up in Kent. And at that point, sterling soars, because as you rightly say, the pound has been very closely tracking um, Brexit negotiations. And again, from the perspective of the government, particularly, it indicates certainty about the future, which means that the ability to uh, solve or reach trade agreements with uh, third parties becomes much more likely. The point about this is double effect. Third parties want to know if the UK is going to have a deal with the EU or not before they resolve deals with us. Hmm. In some ways, we were quite lucky that the Japanese were so keen to get ahead and want, and gave us a really good example of a deal with the third parties, which some people will argue has unlocked process, progress in the Brexit negotiations and encouraged the EU uh, to progress things with us because it was an example of the UK progressing with third parties. But many third parties want to know what sure footing they're going to be on with the UK and what our obligations are going to be to the continent before reaching a deal with us. So it's a double effect. So a, a positive result is no trouble with trade flows, no, no, no issue with the internal market in the UK, and the UK can do deals with third countries on the day release. Uh, Alex, I just want to ch let's change the subject slightly because um, I had a question from the floor here, and it ties in with a subject I wanted to raise, which relates to the US presidential elections. Um, over the past couple of days, um, there have been stories doing the rounds in the British press. Um, the first was a piece in The Guardian that talked about uh, Ivan Rogers, the former UK ambassador to the EU, um, describing um, European, a, a number of senior European leaders having suspicions that, that uh, Boris Johnson uh, was waiting for the outcome of the US presidential election in order to take a stance on a no deal, uh, preferring that potentially to a kind of rather thin and watered down uh, Brexit deal. The second was a piece in the Financial Times that highlighted the fact that number 10 has had no substantive um, discussions with the Biden campaign, uh, which is, I think, quite a lot, we're quite surprising to, to many Brits uh, with, with knowledge of this kind of thing, because given the lead that the Biden campaign has in the polls and the possible suspicion and the, the issues surrounding the Good Friday Agreement, all that sort of stuff, uh, how, is this, how is this playing? And, and, and to what extent is this undermining and strengthening different bargaining positions in the process? Sure, and I see Ricard's question in the, the chat, Trump or, or Biden, what will be the impact on negotiations? So let me try and answer both of those things. I think this is going to be a very close election in the United States. I think it's going to be far closer than the headline figures uh, suggest. Uh, the Democrats are piling up votes in states that they've already won, uh, which does not help them in the Electoral College. And even though the um, uh, polling would suggest that Biden's lead in battleground states is better than Hillary Clinton's was at this point in 2016. It's still very often within the margin of error. And we've seen registrations of Republicans much higher than, um, uh, than in past years in those states. And we've seen uh, significant, um, and of course, Democrats aren't coming out to rallies in the same way because they fear coronavirus more than Republicans do, broadly speaking. But we've seen huge rallies for the president. And, and of course, the president is always under polled. He was plainly under polled in um, in 2016 when he won the election. And I remember very well looking at polling analysis in 2016, which had Hillary Clinton at 95% certainty, as certain as you can be short of uh, having uh, the views of God uh, that she was going to win um, the election then. So I think it's going to be a very close election. Um, uh, and I actually think the impact on Brexit will be far smaller than people are suggesting either way. Let me say why I uh, said that, but there are a couple of, of wrinkles to that. 
Um, plainly, President Trump smiled upon Brexit in a way that Hillary Clinton did not. Hillary Clinton cleaved to the Obama line, which Joe Biden has wafted at, not as firmly as um, his predecessors, but has wafted at most particularly over the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. Um, the position taken by Donald Trump is very different. He prefers bilateral deals, plainly, uh, to multilateral deals in the way that he's approached things from the United States. He uh, is fond of the United Kingdom. He owns several properties in the UK, most especially Scotland. He was over the moon at the exposure that he and his family had to the Queen and the royal family. Um, you talk about soft power. That was something that really succeeded. And he has sent uh, ambassadors to the United Kingdom that talk aggressively about how positive a deal between the UK and the US would be. Use rhetoric about it that's far more positive than the UK government does um, about the prospect for such a deal. So that definitely is part of the context. But it's not, it's not that particularly Biden has a, a massively anti-British perspective in the way that British, some Brits have accused him of having, or indeed many more perceive um, President Obama as having uh, because of various things that people alleged about um, President Obama's background, exaggerated or not, uh, and, talk, uh, and the, the legacy of colonialism, which they alleged that President uh, Obama felt, uh, and perhaps Joe Biden doesn't so much. Biden is in some ways the last of his generation, a throwback to a Eurocentric American politician, someone who sees the world through a Cold War prism. We're talking about someone, after all, who was first elected in 1972. And in lots of ways, he's a return to an older generation than his past master, President Obama. The difference between those approaches isn't about whether you're pro-UK or pro-Germany or France, for argument's sake. It's the way that you perceive the world. And the bigger change about multilateralism and, and bilateralism might matter to Brexit. The, the main one, though, is about President Obama's focus, the pivot to the Asia Pacific, which Joe Biden just doesn't feel in his bones in the same way. He's the last of those presidents who continues to think about the importance of, of Europe as a center of battle and as the center of the Cold War and as leaders that he spent a gen his life, political lifetime reaching out to and understanding. That's the big difference. The big difference is that he's just more interested in our continent generally uh, than his, his forebear on the democratic side. I'd say one more thing about it, which I hope is of interest to you. Um, uh, when I went around the United States in January talking to a series of, of businesses, like I'm talking to you now, but you know, when we did that thing called traveling and we were allowed to meet in person, um, one of the things that was very plain about uh, American perspectives on the UK uh, was that they absolutely hated our admission of Huawei into our 5G national infrastructure across the board. It was not a Democrat or a Republican perspective or point of view. And one of the things that I would identify as being less of a difference between a, a Biden presidency, if we have one, and the Trump presidency, is their attitude towards China. Yes, it will be a different presidency on the Paris Accords, on the IMF, on the WTO, on the WHO, but it will be far closer to the Republican tradition now on China than uh, it has, would have been either two, two or three years ago. One of the achievements of the Trump presidency, almost completely unremarked on, is the, it, it, the way it's moved the political consensus on China towards its own views on patent protection and violation, on copyright violation, on Huawei, and yes, on coronavirus and where it originated. The Trump's line of being far more aggressive on China would be somewhat mollified and more emollient by a Biden presidency, because that's the nature of Joe Biden, but by no means as much as you might have seen otherwise. I mean, we, are, we would see a far more robust position from the Biden presidency um, on, on that issue than you might have expected. But just, just picking up on this a little bit, I mean, at the end of the day, are you suggesting that a Biden victory in no way undermines or, or kind of weakens uh, the British position in these no negotiations? Because, of course, there's no certainty here of a trade deal. So there's already been noises about the fact that there would be, that would have to be conditional on particular assurances and so forth. It's going to it's surely going to weaken the position at this time. Um, I don't think so. I mean, I, so I didn't ask the other part of your question either. I don't put much credence to the Ivan Rogers story at all. I don't think that um, uh, the government is waiting to see what the outcome of the US election is before uh, determining whether to proceed with a, a deal or not. Um, you are right in one sense in that um, President Trump's aggressive bilateralism and his preference for um, 
country-to-country uh, -country deals uh, would, uh, would point towards a more positive environment for a post-Brexit Britain than one that prefers multilateral agreements uh, such as the democratic tradition uh, would tend to favour and indeed as Joe Biden's um, view more generally would tend to favour as well. But we, you can put too much on individuals and you can also put too much on uh, too, too much weight on these things when the, there are almost no two closer trading partners than the UK and the US already. The US is the UK's largest investor but the UK is the US's largest investor. Every day more than a million Americans get up and work for a British company and more than a million Brits get up and work for an American company. Um, because of an attract there's quite an attractive uh, small difference in the way that we define trade surpluses so that both the UK and the US US claim to have a small trade surplus with one another, um, whilst of course our trade deficit with the EU is uh, in goods is, is yawning. Uh, so, um, so that will all continue different things and it, it's not least about the prospect for expansion of, and recognition of um, a, a, a recognition of of um, the ability thing like accountancy and law and um, financial um, advisory work um, and so forth. Um, there is and things thing. that the city and, and services are good at um, in the UK. Yeah, I, I, Ricard Sorry, uh, Ian, I lost you there. Has, has raised an important question, I think, about the um, discussion about fishing rights at the moment, especially as it's reared its head after a period of media calm. This was the issue that uh, was brought to our attentions again yesterday. Um, Ricard, I wonder if you want to join the call and ask the question live. I think you may have to unmute Emil. Yeah, yeah thank you. Ah, thank no. you very much for interesting uh, presentation uh, and discussion. I, I, I like to ask you, what do you think about fishery? Is it really uh, uh, important for the British government or is it just a bargaining ship that they try to force the Macron and the French to, to, sure. to make a deal? Uh, and also a question about state aid. What do you think about state aid? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, French companies are, are subsidizing their own car manufacturers, the French government are subsidizing French car manufacturers. I mean, it's, uh, is it possible for, for, for Johnson to introduce state aid again in the UK? I think sure. thought it was abolished by Thatcher a long time Thatcher, ago. Yeah. yeah, okay. So on the, on the one hand, uh, I'll answer both of those. Fishing. Uh, the UK wanted a kind of Norway style deal where there are annual negotiations between the third country and the EU, uh, which would result in significantly more quota for the UK and potentially for payments for access to British waters. And the EU wanted reciprocal access to the UK waters under existing conditions uh, with the fishing uh, opportunities dictated by the common fisheries policy, which is part of the, the reason to leave the EU to get away from that. Uh, in answer to your question about how important it is, politically it's very important, uh, symbolically, and you know, a, a gesture to our, towards our fishermen. And conscious whilst this, though I am that this is being recorded, you know, economically, it's not important at all. It's not important for anybody. It's not important as a percentage of the UK's uh, economic activity. It's not important as a percentage of the French uh, economic activity, where it represents, to my understanding, some 0.06% of GDP for France. Um, it, it is politically, symbolically important for both sides. The, the idea, by the way, that President Macron would willfully seek to get to a position that produced no deal under which you would also have no access to British waters anyway and get the same worst outcome from your perspective results on fishing as on everything else seems to me a bit daft. But the, I think the fishing situation is somewhere where we're quite likely to see compromise that will be decried by all sides. I think that Britain will allow some tapered access to our waters um, over a period of years potentially with or without payment. Mac President Macron has al alluded to a willingness to pay uh, at some points. He, he said he, he, he demands absolute access, then he's willing to compromise. Then he demands absolute access, then he's willing to make a payment. But there, I think there is room for, for compromise on that position. The UK, I think, will compromise and say, uh, will allow access, and the EU's demands will be far smaller than hitherto they've been. And, and some stakeholders on both sides will say we've been betrayed. British fishermen will say we've been betrayed. Um, continental fishermen will say they've been betrayed and so forth. But I think we'll get a, a compromise on fishing. On state aid, on the one hand, you are right. The United Kingdom is a laissez-faire, free market-driven economy, which is far less likely to underpin or uh, support failing industries than other uh, market economies. So for example, 
Unilever sought to re-domicile um, after uh, an appro a hostile approach from Kraft Heinz. I declare an interest. I was working for Kraft Heinz. Um, uh, an, an approach from Kraft Heinz. They sought to re-domicile solely to the Netherlands. Um, their shareholders said, no, you can't do that because we want you to be exposed to the rigorous market proceedings that happen from your listing in the UK. And if you have to choose between those listings, you're going to choose the UK solely. Interestingly, this is one of the things that I think is worth thinking about when you think about uh, potential winners and losers. You know, the Netherlands are going to see some of their major listed, dual listed business coming to uh, the UK. But the reason that happened wasn't to do with Brexit. It was to do with Unilever preferring the Dutch interpretation of state intervention over uh, businesses which are deemed to be socially beneficial. The Dutch, for example, have a far more broad definition of when government should intervene and protect a business and say that you shouldn't be taken over. The British tradition is far more straight down the line, the price is the price is the price and the market uh, will out. So on the one hand, you are right, Britain has a far, it, it, it would be peculiar to assume that the UK were going to pursue a, a, a doggedly pro-state aid position. But on the other hand, depending on how you see state aid and how you would define it, we're all rampant state aiders now because of our responses to coronavirus. We're all rampantly propping up businesses and handing out money to businesses that would otherwise go under, um, paying their employees, making loans on favourable terms. We're doing that which otherwise would be deemed to be state aid. And we are collectively turning a blind eye to it. It's like Admiral Nelson holding the telescope to his blind eye and saying, I see no ships. <laughs> Everyone's in this kind of communal con now about state aid and saying, I, I can't see any state aid. Lufthansa received an enormous state bailout in the course of coronavirus. I mean, so, and nobody foul, cry, cried foul because they were thinking, well, we're probably going to have to bail out our airline next. So um, actually the state aid conversation, if you think about the issues that are currently outstanding, the fisheries one I've discussed, and I think even Michel Barnier thinks it's too tall. He yeah, thinks that the fishing demands are, are, are too much, and I think a compromise gets done on that. The state aid one, we've just now been canvassing together, and I think that it will, it's peculiar to imagine the UK pursuing a rampantly state aid uh, position given its free market background, but certainly no more than other countries are going to be given the, the situation in coronavirus. The um, mutual recognition one, I think we are very likely, I mean, there have been concessions being made all around now about how we recognize each other's A, regulations and B, qualifications. And I think that um, on, on that one, we are likely to see movement, not least because the EU wants to have continued and uninterrupted access to the city of London, where they're buying debt, and many of these are debt-driven uh, economies, obviously. But moreover, our rules aren't just similar to the EU's. We've just come out as a member state. Our rules are identical to the European Union's. Of course, the UK will diverge over time, uh, potentially. And, uh, and I think that the UK will say, we reserve the right to uh, diverge from these rules over time. And the EU will say, we reserve the right to say you've diverged too far. We recognize your right as a sovereign state to diverge, but uh, we reserve the right to say you've diverged too far and you're now outside the agreement that you agreed with us back at the end of 2020. And their honor will be served and kind of we'll, we'll, we'll say everything's fine on the uh, mutual recognition and, and fair level playing field uh, discussion. Uh, the EU has basically conceded there won't be a major role for the ECJ in, dis in, dis in resolving disputes between the parties. That was a sticking point, basically gone away. And so what you're left with is wash up uh, discussions about things like social security provision. And given that the UK continues to pay pension for millions of people, most, most noticeably retirees in Spain, but in lots of places, uh, paying pension provision and, and, um, and recognizing um, social security ar arrangements uh, for others uh, around the EU who come from a UK background, I foresee that, that it's, it, that's doable. That's, that's doable in the same way that you reach agreements on, on movement between um, countries, between third friendly parties. So the, 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 the areas of disagreement are actually pretty small. Thanks for that, Ricard. Um, actually, on a related point, because you mentioned winners and losers there, Alex, um, there's been a lot of attention over the past couple of weeks given to the remaining sticking points of the deal. Um, but even if an agreement is forth forthcoming, this broad brush agreement is going to take a long time to refine. And obviously, aside from good news for people in public affairs, there's going to be clearly a lot up for grabs in all of this. You've mentioned a little bit about the winners and losers so far there. Perhaps you can go into that a little bit more. But looking ahead, who would you expect to be benefiting from the changes we might see? So um, the first example, I think, of, of, of people who 
really believe they're going to benefit from Brexit and almost certainly will are countries that import or export from third nations, so outside of the European Union, where their business has been challenged or even stymied in some progress uh, because of the protectionist customs union that the European Union can be. So, for example, <coughs> if you were uh, the, the market in the, in the whole of the EU for solar panels is basically um, prices are kept high in order to, to protect a couple of German manufacturers. Whereas if you were allowing market forces to, to predominate, we would have lots of Chinese manufactured, very much cheaper solar panels all across, um, all across uh, European buildings. And that is part of, it may sound abstract, but it's part of why when new buildings go up across the whole of the EU, they don't have solar panels on the roofs generally because the prices are too high. And so that's a significant financial difference. But, but and then right up, so that's a kind of new technology, renewables, trendy end of, of benefit. And then right at the other end of the kind of raw materials discussion, Tate and Lyle, which is a British business uh, that works in cane sugar from former colonies of the, of the United Kingdom, where the price of their raw goods has been kept high because European um, rules want to protect native EU, EU sugar beet manufacturers, which also exist in the UK like Silver Spoon, but exist right across uh, the whole of, uh, of the EU. They are very likely to benefit. On the other hand, uh, and I'm cognizant I'm talking to uh, a well-qualified group of people from Sweden, in which I've spent many happy times, and my client, my former client Saab Aerospace is based. I think it's very difficult to envisage a swift return to um, pieces of, uh, of manufacturing that regularly cross uh, to and fro between um, states uh, with fr frictionless borders uh, before a manufacturing process is completed, uh, whether it be in aviation where wings do that kind of thing or engines can sometimes do that kind of thing. But sometimes that will mean people double down and stay in, in certain environments more than others. Uh, and of course, in the UK, where we've very closely watched our automotive uh, sector and sought to see what's happening next with um, manufacturers from third countries who may or may not uh, be concerned about the future of, of British manufacturing when we're out of the EU. There's actually been no diminution in commitment to the UK market. Indeed, Nissan, which told uh, its investors that it would leave the UK if we didn't join the euro back when that was on the table, and then said that it would leave the UK if we didn't, if we voted to leave the EU has now doubled down with a new plant in the UK. So you may see some recommitment to UK manufacturing, which may become more may become easier um, for some manufacturing plants. On the other hand, you may see in the example I gave for aviation, somebody saying it's not worth my while trying to do this if there are going to be customs barriers between uh, these countries. That's why it's so important to try and resolve the customs uh, point. But there's a third point that members of this Chamber of Commerce will be um, aware of, which is the recognition under existing agreements, let's say the one that South Korea has with the EU, of a lower or no tariff rate that's attracted uh, because the parts are EU. So in a, uh, um, a car that's been manufactured between the UK and the EU and is then sold in South Korea, does the UK part count under a future agreement as being from the EU and its friends, and therefore attract a far lower tariff, or not, in which case the car may have to have a higher price, or the manufacturer may have to pay a higher tariff. Well, that's the people who are trying to calculate that, that's plainly a loser um, side of the, the, the piece of paper. Yeah, I, I've, I'm conscious of the fact I've got like a whole host of questions here, but I've noticed on the on the forum, we have a couple of really interesting questions that we should go through. And then we can come back and maybe ask one final one from from this end. Um, Christina B. Nordstrom, I don't know if you're uh, online right now and if you want to unmute, but I think it's a really interesting question and it's sort of connected with the previous conversation. So, Christine, are you are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the uh, interesting conversation uh, we've had. My question is, as a naive observer, um, uh, risk is uh, meant to equal reward, but it only does so on an average. How major or minor has the disentanglement from EU rules and regulations impacted on UK? And what is the most challenging task in the UK at the moment? Thank you very much. It's a really interesting question. Um, 
some people will argue that the potential for success um, for the United Kingdom able to um, forward its own economic future and do trade deals with third parties outside of the uh, EU framework is vastly greater than the potential uh, risk that's uh, involved. Many others, of course, on the other hand, will argue that um, benefits of European Union uh, membership, not least unfettered access to one of the world's largest and most successful single markets, um, dwarfs any potential benefit that the UK will be able to negotiate with third parties, many of which the UK has deal with anyway through its EU membership, or did have a deal with through, the, uh, through EU membership. Part of, so part of the challenge is going to be seeking to convert as quickly as possible the low-hanging fruit of available deals um, into meaningful third party deals between the UK and other uh, countries, so as to ensure that trade can be uninterrupted between um, those countries when the transition period is over. In some ways, the UK has benefited from this kind of half in, half out position in the transition, which some might mischievously observe reflects the UK's perpetual attitude towards the European Union anyway. You know, someone said to me, okay, look, you've been half in, half out for 30 years, now you're going to be half out, half in. Well, that that accurately describes this transition period. But when it ends, the, the part of the biggest change may not actually be between the UK and the EU. It may be between the UK and third parties, with which the UK hitherto had free trade deals by dint of its EU membership. So much focus on Brexit, but the challenge for getting deals done with those other third party countries, look, I gave the South Korean example, is time. Time is the biggest challenge because um, you want to be able to ensure uh, uninterrupted provision and, and, and continuity of, of exchange of goods and services. Uh, the biggest opportunity, I think, for the UK, it, I've already mentioned, it's the um, ability to pursue its own trade deals and preference the importance of what the UK is best at, which is services. Uh, the EU has never put services into a, a trade deal. Um, and it, I, one might argue, had the UK voted to remain in the EU, that path would have been unchanged. The fact that the UK is very good at it would, would not weigh particularly heavily on the mindset of EU negotiators arguing on behalf of what would have been the 28 had the UK remained in. And then there's one risk that's worth mentioning that the UK is avoiding. In some ways, we come full circle, and this reflects the coronavirus discussion and how it's changed everything. Many of the economies within the European Union are debt laden and would look to be economic time bombs that are uh, at some point the, the bomb's going to go off and you know the impact will be closest in the country itself uh, and then next closest on the countries that it's in a currency union with and then next closest to the countries that are in a political union with it and then next closest for everybody else and the further away you get from for example Italy which might pursue uh, a path like the Greek uh, debt situation but is too big to bail out uh, frankly um, the better off you are away from it. That's part of the traditional British perspective of the the of a, of being getting away from risk of European membership and the potential for a exposure to bailout. However, we're all now debt laden. We're all now debt laden to an unprecedented level because of coronavirus. So I don't know how much that argument will, carries much strength anymore. Uh, Alex, we're, we're running out of time. There was an anonymous question about the future of, of EU and NATO and so forth. I think that, to be yeah. honest, is a day seminar and all of this in its own right. Well, I can give you, I can, let me give it a one-liner, which is that the UK will put an increased weight on its membership of the organisations in which it continues to be a member, and indeed in which its membership changes. Part of the um, impact of the UK leaving the EU is that it regains a seat at the WTO, which it has not had since we um, joined the, the then European Economic Community and, and waived our seat um, at the WTO. I think that the UK will start attaching more importance to its membership of those other organisations. And I would include, interesting question, thank you for it, I would include NATO. And I would think that we are likely to see more weight put on uh, our NATO activity and also more importance put onto our membership of the P5 in the UN. Um, another quick question about the Red Wall in the north of England and the yeah. fact that the, there's a disproportionate impact on manufacturing here with the flow of goods uh, going across borders. How seriously do you think the Conservatives have taken those political seats um, that will flip back to, to Labour potentially? It's a great question and I think that the Conservative Party is very keen to hang on to those seats, not least the MPs who were elected in them, uh, who constitute a significant part of Boris Johnson's majority. But actually a lot of those seats voted for Brexit and it's uh, a lot of them uh, urge on um, a hard Brexit in a way that uh, you might be surprised by. A lot of them are amongst the most fervent advocates um, of leaving 
um, arrangements with the EU. And there was this, Sunderland's a very interesting kind of just example, but you know, lots of, uh, of those kinds of seats have been in that, um, that environment. The challenges that are faced in the, those seats are not particularly about Brexit because the Labour Party is no longer seeking to circumvent the Conservative Party on the point. The challenges for the Conservative Party are domestic ones. You don't lose those seats because of the Brexit arrangement. You lose them because of free school meal debates and you haven't um, been seen as caring enough for people who are not so well off in the United Kingdom. Alex, I've got one final question for you. I've got actually loads of questions for you, to be honest with you, but this is my final one. And I don't, I don't want to leave it on the low or anything, so maybe you can pick us up. What are the prospects after January next year that the two sides of the Brexit divide in the UK can be reconciled again? I mean, will the UK be fated to years more of turmoil as the Remainer or rejoin voice yeah. rears its head during a period of almost certain economic hardship? Um, there is a cathartic experience from something actually finishing, right? This is the other hidden moments of why you, people might not be inclined to extend the transition period. Can't we just finish this? And I think that, you know, if you reflect on the fact that our Brexit vote was more than four years ago now, our ability to move on from it is, is going to be a significant part of how we progress and, and flourish in the future. And I think I, I would argue that actually coronavirus has been a signal. There was always going to be something that came along that changed the political debate and made us focus on something else. Did we think it was going to be a global pandemic? Probably not. But it is nevertheless something that has seized us and forced our attention to something else. Brexit in this context does, even though we're going through the last stages of Brexit, when it's arguably most important, it feels in some British political senses like it's, it's yesterday's debate. Alex, thank you very much. Christina, we can't hear you. You're muted. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I just kept talking. <laughs> I mean... Thank you so much. This has by far exceeded at least my expectations and I think a lot of our participants as well and, and I hope and it feels like we could, have gone, we could have possibly gone on for another hour easily. Maybe we there is time for this another time to, to do a follow up, Alex. I'll come back in 2021 sharing your uh, inside knowledge into where we're all going and I'm extremely pleased to hear that you're foreseeing a deal um, sometime soon hopefully <laughs> and Ian thank you very much for for leading this discussion and I know you had lots more questions and let's keep them for for later on thank you everyone for thank you Painting. And thank you, Michael Taylor, for, for actually uh, introducing Alex. Thank you, Michael. Us. And thank you, everyone, for asking great questions. We look forward to seeing you later on today, where we have the opportunity of listening to a conversation with Gordon Brown, actually. Um, maybe, uh, Alex, you want to join us? <laughs> I, uh, I've heard his perspective many times. It's going to be a bit yes, different. I can, I can see that. On Thursday, we will hear Nudia's uh, chief um, economic uh, chief economist rather speak about their views of, of our financial forecast which is so important to all of us but thank you so much for today everyone Alex Ian um, we're so pleased um, do have a great day and we look forward to seeing you soon thank you bye-bye thank you bye